This week, we're going to shift our focus a bit. Where we had been looking at measuring techniques appropriate to the core of the network, we're now going to spend a little time looking at the edge of the network, in particular, residential broadband networks. Of course, there are a number of technologies present in access networks, which include cellular networks, residential broadband, as well as enterprise customer networks, each of which have their own features and properties. Residential broadband is often considered to be a bit messy because many of the considerations have to do with the environmental conditions as opposed to the network technologies themselves. Where the core of the network exists in large routers handling terabits of traffic in large data centers with massive power and cooling capabilities, residential broadband generally consists of small devices in people's homes, which tend to be abused, shut off randomly, rebooted, maybe zapped by lightning, or stuck in places without proper ventilation. And then the equipment serving those last mile connections tend to be in small metal boxes on street corners, again, not necessarily the best provided for, and often subject to various types of outages, such as digging up the fibers, traffic accidents, etc. But when it is all working, there are some specific properties that we can examine about the performance of residential broadband. And in particular, in this talk, we'll look at cable and DSL connections. I should mention that this particular study was done a number of years ago, so the absolute numbers that we see won't look particularly impressive in terms of today's connection speeds. However, the principles and trade-offs considered are still relevant today. As with the other papers we've studied, we have the advantage of using the slides provided by the authors. As I mentioned, the last mile can often be somewhat unloved by network purists who are put off by the messiness and environmental factors constraining these networks. However, the performance of these networks is highly relevant to the end consumers that are purchasing these services, as well as for regulators and policymakers who want to know if ISPs are delivering the services advertised and also have to consider the increasing transition of emergency services to run over internet connections instead of traditional telephone lines. So the first question that needs to be addressed is, what do we even mean by performance? What specific metrics do we care about? Then the question is how to measure them. Unlike the core of the network, where a researcher may be able to get vantage points on two different sides of the network and measure what lies between, by definition, the last mile ends up at a company or home. So it's very difficult for a researcher to get a pair of vantage points that span the last mile link. And that limits the sorts of measurements that can be conducted at scale. One way to conduct a measurement is to wait for the customer to voluntarily conduct the measurement. For example, connecting to speedtest.net to measure their own ISP performance. However, these measurements are conducted irregularly and we're unable to observe all of the confounding factors that may affect the measurement. Another way to conduct measurements is to build them in to the gateways that exist inside the customer's home. So we're increasingly seeing the providers of the gateway hardware, this is the DSL modem or cable modem in common terminology. We're increasingly seeing those providers, including some way of measuring the last mile performance in their hardware. Typically, this means that the device periodically does speed tests back to a known third party speed test provider, such as speedtest.net or MLAB or one of the others. So in this talk, we'll see how some of the measurements from the gateway are designed and also find out about some of the properties observed of these last mile connections. One of the advantages of using the gateway is the gateway itself is aware of what other traffic is passing through it that might have an impact on the measurement itself. Due to the FCC's interest in this problem, they have in the past worked with Samnos to distribute gateways that have these tests built into them to thousands of residential broadband customers that then provide tests on a regular basis. So part of the results shown in this paper are from that deployment. And then the group writing this paper itself also deployed some gateways that were able to perform on-demand measurements for the purposes of this study. Probably the most highly advertised feature of residential broadband networks is the bandwidth, which we can measure as throughput. But as we'll see, the specific technique used for measuring throughput can have an effect on the results gathered. A metric that is generally not advertised by the ISPs is latency. However, this also has a very large effect on the user experience due to the close correlation between TCP's operation and round trip times. Here we see a few different techniques compared for measuring throughput. And on the CDF, better performance is to the right. 
So we see that single threaded HTTP measurements generally show the lowest performance. We're just measuring passive throughput, meaning observing the bitrate without performing an active measurement provides a result somewhere in the middle. And then performing a multi-threaded TCP measurement yields the highest performance numbers in general. And this makes sense. As we know, TCP is optimized to share bandwidth across multiple flows. A single TCP flow cannot typically achieve high utilization of a bottleneck link. In the case of passive throughput, other factors besides the bandwidth of the last mile link probably dominate the performance. And so the multi-threaded TCP test is able to most closely measure the residential broadband link because in that case, the researchers are able to control both ends of the TCP connection. Then we come to the issue of traffic shaping. While it's often not mentioned in the ISP's advertising materials, traffic shaping is a big part of offering these last mile services. However, in this particular example, the ISP was advertising something they were calling Power Boost, which was their name for traffic shaping. Basically, it would allow an initial period of high bandwidth and then reduce the rate at which a particular flow was allowed to operate. This was exclusive to cable broadband services because their shared architecture lends itself to statistical multiplexing. So for these three individual users, we see that their tests vary dramatically from the initial bandwidth to the sustained bandwidth. In the case of user three, the initial burst was higher, but shorter in duration, where users two and three were able to burst to a lower speed, but it lasted longer in duration. The implication of this for the researcher is that if the measurement ends during the high performance period, the resulting estimate of the throughput will be very different than it would be if the measurement lasted beyond the 10 to 15 second mark and then averaged the high performance period with the low performance period. As I mentioned, this is enabled on cable systems, which can benefit from statistical multiplexing because they have many users in a neighborhood sharing the bandwidth. And so providing this burst period actually benefits the ISP because it allows flows to complete in a shorter period of time, which in turn allows for more effective statistical multiplexing. So in fact, it enables them to oversubscribe their links at a higher rate. Now we want to compare some properties of the access links that affect performance. We can do latency measurements a few different ways. The easiest is probably end to end. So latency to a nearby server. This is what you measure if you ping something like a web server that you're trying to connect to. Then we have the latency of the last mile itself, which can be measured by pinging the edge of the ISP network, which takes a little more care because we need to find out the IP address within the network and measure the round trip time to that instead of measuring to the IP address of a server. But as we'll see, these measurements can vary significantly if the link is congested. So here we have a histogram binned by latency, showing where the different providers tend to fall as a fraction of their users. And so we see that the vast majority of the cable ISP users fall in the zero to 10 millisecond bin. And this is specifically the last mile latency. So how long it takes for a packet to get from the user's residence to the ISP's network through their last mile connection. However, with the DSL ISPs, we see that there are a much broader range of latencies present and that a healthy percentage of the users wind up in the 20 to 30 millisecond range. Now, a few tens of milliseconds may not sound very high. In fact, most of us are not particularly aware of the passing of 20 or 30 milliseconds. However, let's talk a little bit about what this means in terms of loading a web page. So if we have a cable connection on one hand with a 10 millisecond latency and a DSL connection on the other hand with a 20 millisecond latency, in terms of round trip times, that 10 millisecond difference is going to become a 20 millisecond difference. Each time a web page is loaded, TCP requires many round trip times, first for the handshake, then for loading the page, and then for loading each additional object. Before any of that happens, we're also likely to have a DNS lookup. And if some of the referenced objects come from other domains, we have additional DNS lookups required to load those. So many modern web pages require hundreds of round trip times in order to load. I'm simplifying this because there is pipelining involved, but if we just take the round number of 100 round trip times, our 20 millisecond difference becomes a two second difference. So a page may take two seconds longer to load over a DSL connection than over a cable connection. And this is something that I've personally been able to observe having a cable and DSL connection in the same place at the same time from two different providers.
So a two second latency difference is definitely something that users will observe and will make one connection feel very much slower than the other. Studies of human behavior note that users are sensitive to latencies above 200 milliseconds and will significantly reduce their viewing of web pages as latencies grow above that mark. Okay, so we've statistically observed that there is increased latency on DSL connections. The question is, where does that latency come from? Well, it turns out that DSL connections, since they operate over crusty old copper phone lines, tend to be subject to lots of noise, which causes burst losses. And one of the ways they mitigate this is called interleaving. So without interleaving, each frame will be broken up into multiple blocks with redundancy so that if any one block is lost, the frame can still be reconstructed by the receiver without being retransmitted. As we know, retransmissions are very costly for TCP connections, which is most of internet traffic. However, because DSL is subject to burst losses, it's often the case that more than one block would be lost and thus the entire frame would be lost. So interleaving intersperses the blocks from different frames. And so the burst loss might take out one block from a bunch of different frames. And so all the frames can still be reconstructed by the receiver without being retransmitted. The cost of doing this is that the last block of each frame is now significantly delayed from where it originally would have been transmitted. And so the receiver has to buffer all of these frames until it gets all the blocks for each frames and can reconstruct them. And that's where this additional latency comes in in a DSL connection. Because cable systems operate under coaxial cable, which is naturally more resistant to outside interference, cable modems do not use this mechanism. So the interleaving trade-off means that for a given connection and bit error rate, one user may have low latency and high loss if interleaving were turned off. And if the interleaving is turned on, then the latency will be higher, but the loss will be lower. The low loss link will generally have better throughput with TCP because every time a packet is lost, TCP reduces its window size and thus reduces its utilization. So low loss is important for TCP. However, when we're dealing with transactional connections, such as clicking a link and then expecting the web page to load immediately, that high latency becomes a much larger factor in determining the user's experience. On the other hand, the user with low latency might be able to load web pages quickly, but will experience low overall throughput when downloading or streaming due to the packet losses and TCP's reduced window size. So the moral of the story is it's better to use a medium with fewer errors and not have to incur this performance penalty. Now we're going to look at one more source of latency in this system, and these are in the modem buffers. So the modem buffers are used when there is more upstream traffic than can be handled by the upstream link. And the purpose of a link buffer is to hold bursts of traffic that arrive and send it out, maximizing utilization of the link, assuming that the arriving traffic will be bursty in nature. However, as we know, one source of latency is queuing delay, and the longer packets sit in these buffers, the higher their overall latency will be. So here we have a measurement of the upstream, and the headline here is that modem buffers are too large. Now, this is not intuitive to most of us who are used to thinking that more memory in a system is better. This is not the case when it comes to link buffers. And in fact, it's such a prevalent issue that we have a term for it, which is buffer bloat. So it used to be the case that memory that was fast enough to use for link buffers was expensive and therefore relatively scarce. Only just enough memory was put into these interfaces to provide the needed buffering. However, as memory became cheaper and cheaper, the manufacturers of the modems just took off the shelf memory chips and added them to the device to use as a link buffer. It turns out that this means that the buffer is capable of holding so many frames that the queuing delay can be massive compared to the other delays in the system. Note in this example that the vertical axis is log scale. So the lowest observed round trip time device is the 2R device at 10 to the 3 milliseconds, or one second of latency. And by measuring both without load and with load, we see that the base latency was around 10 milliseconds. So the buffer in that device is adding two orders of magnitude of latency by buffering the packets for an extended period of time. However, we see that the Motorola device has an even larger buffer, causing around two seconds of latency, and that the Westel device adds another order of magnitude 
actually incurring 10 seconds of queuing delay. We can see that after the load is removed from the buffer, it takes an additional 10 seconds for the buffer to drain as the green line drops off approximately 10 seconds after the other two lines have dropped. So this reminds us that it is important to correctly size link buffers. We covered this in 3502, and I'll link to that video here. And it also reminds us of one of the sources of latency we can look for and potentially mitigate in last mile networks. So in this work, we've seen how researchers were able to measure the last mile and some of the properties of the last mile that they've run into and trade-offs between cable modems and DSL modems. I hope that was helpful. In the next video, we're going to look specifically at measuring outages of the last mile networks. See you then. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell.